Um, thank you, and I appreciate everyone that's here on a Friday late. <laughs> um, and I acknowledge my talk title is way too long, so I'm not going to even try and read it. Um, but you can contact me on the email and Twitter handle there. So a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I work at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, so the data I'm analyzing is patient data. And we're trying to predict which patients would do better on certain therapies. We're on the research side of things, so also trying to develop biomarkers of disease. So it's quite a different focus to, I know, what many of you are working on. But hopefully I will... Um, show you that it's a great field to be in and maybe you'll come over and join us because we need some of the fantastic people that are here. Um, I'm going to, whilst many of the talks um, have focused on supervised learning, um, we're generating very, very large data sets for a lot of cases we don't have the labels. So we're doing a lot of unsupervised clustering, unsupervised analysis at the moment. So I thought it might be um, useful just to review um, some of the methods that are available for matrix factorization. Um, I'm going to talk about classical methods like principal components analysis, correspondence analysis, but also more, some of the more newer methods such as TISNI and Zimbi Wave. Um, I'm also going to say how we apply these to multiple data sets and some of the caveats when actually doing that. And finally, I'll just give one or two little vignettes on the genomic side. So, when I think about cancer, I don't think about one cell or two cells, I think of many cells. And those cells are growing in our bodies, so they're talking to all the other cells. And increasingly, we, we realize that it's not a disease of one cell type. The cancer cell needs to manipulate the local environment in order to bring more blood vessels in as it grows because it gets a little hypoxic or it loses oxygen. It also needs to evade the immune system such that it isn't like killed away by the immune cells that are there. And some of the most exciting therapies for cancer now are actually those which activate the immune system such that your own body can recognize and get rid of the cancer cell. If I stood on this stage even just four years ago, and somebody was presenting with metastatic bladder cancer, that person probably had less than six months to live. We now have a treatment where it's only 15 to 20 percent of those patients, but they're alive five years later without sustaining treatment. So we will never use the word cured, but it's as good as we can get. Those patients aren't taking therapy every day. We've got their immune systems to recognize the metastatic disease, and those people are living happily with their families. And that is where we want to be. And so, oh, I forgot to get the, this is, Okay, so the first slide, the first picture here is just the idea of this complexity within the cell. I work within a laboratory, and this is the only laboratory graphs that I will show. Um, but we observe that when we co-culture, so when we actually, in a dish, in a Petri dish in the lab, if you put in tumor cells, and then if you add in accessory cells, so we add in maybe cells that you might expect in the environment, so maybe some stroma cells or some immune cells, those cancer cells have a different response to drug. Now, since the 1980s, for the past, you know, since I was a kid, the way that pharmaceutical companies have detected new therapies, by and large, is by, skate, by doing mass mass drug screenings. And those are all based on just the tumor cells in a Petri dish, in a plastic dish. We now know that that doesn't recapitulate the tumor microenvironment. And moreover, when we actually just add extra cells into those pet plastic dishes, we see very different responses to many drugs. So we are trying to actually, first of all, understand what's in the tumor, but also then build models in the lab such that we can screen and develop better drugs. In 
in our body, we have many, many cell types. And it's one of my favorite, like, over wine at the end of conferences, asking the clinicians, how many cell types do we think we have? And some will say some hundreds, and some will say, you know, maybe 800, and some might go up to 1,000. We really don't know. But what we do know is that each of those cells has its own function. Your brain cell is not the same as your liver cell, which is not the same as your kidney cell. Each of those have specialized with different functions. Yet every single cell has the same DNA. That DNA that you got from your mom and your dad. And that is the instruction booklet, or essentially the library that every cell has. But each cell essentially goes into that library and checks out a different collection of books or a different collection of instructions. And then we have epigenetics and other things that basically dictate what portions, what portions of the library are essentially open. So what's the available catalog? So then some parts of the genome will be closed off to that cell because maybe of other environmental effects. Cells don't work in isolation. So as part of my PhD, I looked at the connections between the immune system and the nervous system. And I'm sure everybody here can remember the last time you got a cold or the flu or some sort of a bug. And the first thing you do is you want to curl up in your bed and you don't want to talk to anybody and you're running a fever and you don't feel like eating. That's the immune system signaling to the hypothalamus in your brain, well, get to bed because I've got a lot going on and I need to conserve energy here. And actually raise up the temperature because the bugs will grow slower. So our cells are continually talking to the brain, continually talking locally, continually talking to each other. And we are now at that stage of in, in genomics and biology and molecular biology where we can begin to, first of all, find all those cells, and second of all, begin to try to understand how they actually talk to each other. So, we have trillions of cells in our body. And if we think about our microbiome, all those bacteria, the good and the bad ones in your gut, you even have, we estimate there's probably 50 trillion of them. We are dealing with lots and lots of cells. Even if you think of your hand, in your hand you've got two and a half billion cells. How can we scale that up? Well, if every cell was the size as big as a grain of sand, your hand would be the size of a school bus. And whilst we know many of the cell types that are in that cell, we don't really know how they're all talking to each other, what's the regulation. And really to understand cancer and to understand disease, this will be a major step forward. And toward that goal, in the past year, a very exciting project has started. And this is a collaboration between the Broad here in Boston and actually the European Bioinformatics Institute in Cambridge in the UK. And it's called the Human Cell Atlas. And the lofty goal of this project is actually to create a catalog of every cell in the body. The idea of doing single cell RNA sequencing to actually get the, the essentially the catalog of genes that are active in that cell type, and then do it for every cell type. Now, of course, we don't have to really do single cell sequencing of two and a half billion cells in order to identify what's in our hand. We can just sample some of it and we'll have a good in indication. But this will be a very, very exciting project. And we can do that because of the growth of technology. So in the past five years, we really have gone from a situation where maybe we could get maybe 10 cells, 100 cells, to now we can get 100,000 or a million cells. 10x genomics in San Francisco, um, well, they're outside there in Pleasantville, actually. Um, Pleasanton, Pleasanton, outside of San Francisco, recently released a data set that had 1.3 million neurons. So we're talking of a data set that's like, I don't know, 30,000 genes. If we map it to the transcripts, it's maybe 100,000 by 1.3 million. And these are the data sets that we are now getting into the lab. Maybe not quite that scale yet, but it's actually getting there. And I've 
I would provide all these slides, and if you're interested in looking at these, there's very, very detailed um, tutorials on how to analyze these data that the community is making available. And within the Bioconductor Project, which is a large project um, within R, um, we are actually generating packages in order to be able to deal with that scale of data. Um, and this is just a subset of those. Um, Bioconductor has about 1,700 or so packages in our packages. Um, because our data sets tend to be, you know, we're getting DNA data sets or RNA data sets or proteomics data sets, we're reading in structured formats and then we're retaining a lot of the annotation in it. So we rely on S4 classes in our lot. But we've developed packages called Delayed Array, which allow out-of-memory access to data. RESTful SC is actually a HDF5 remote server, it can be on the cloud, and you can actually query, if you look at the vignette for this package, you can query the 10x package in real time, so that's the 1.3 million cells, and actually subset that and just bring down subsets of that very, very easily and quickly. Um, there's we're, the single cell experiment will support the Loom, which is a structured HDF5 format. We're developing methods for sparsity, for single cell RNA sequencing, and for um, iterative um, interactive visualization of these data. Um, anybody who's in Boston, this is just a shout out. I organize the meetup. Um, their next meeting is the 18th of May, and our annual conference is in. Um, July this year in Toronto. Um, abstracts close, I think, the 17th of um, May. So that's kind of where we are with the data. Anytime when we get a large data set, my own feeling is that we need to do exploratory data analysis on this because I was burned too many times by batch effects and artifacts and data and thought I had found something I haven't. Um, and this is um, John Tookie, and this book was actually released in 1977, but I love this quote, the greatest value of a picture is when it forces you to notice what we never expected to see. And that can be exciting biology, the next big thing in cancer, or it could be a batch effect. But either way, we need to know about it, and really we need to know about it before we start applying linear models on the data. And I feel that as the data sets get larger, and particularly these are very novel data sets that we're d dealing with, we don't really know what are the noise, what's the variance in it. We want to make sure that we're sampling that data and getting a good feel for what's going on such that we're not just looking at the tail and thinking we have a tail when we really have an elephant. This is roughly the pipeline for most of um, the genomic data analysis we do. We take in some data, we do some transformations on it. Um, for these large data sets, we need to downsample on them, and we're going to be using some principal components or dimension reduction method, and then generating some clusters such that we can identify the number of cell types. However, we don't know the variant structure in these, and we really want to have methods such that we can identify those hidden patterns. Um, we may have temporal effects, we may have additional cell types that we might not expect, um, or we may have problems such as doublet cells. So we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about methods for detecting those hidden patterns in data and what we can do about them. And just in case anybody's not very good at the magic eye, this is what this was. I'm, I'm useless at those things. Um, so I'm going to start by a little review of classic um, dimension reduction methods. And this is quite an old field. Can I just ask how many people know principal components analysis? Or Everybody. Okay, I'll go through it really quickly then. Um, and principal components analysis, depending on whether you come from computer science or statistics, you will argue that it was described in 1901 or in 1977. <laughs> 
I'm going to go with 1901. I'm going to talk about correspondence analysis as well very, very briefly. This was a method that's also called reciprocal scaling and is related to wavelet decomposition that was originally described by Greenacre in the 1970s in France. Um, and then I'll just mention some of the others briefly. This is actually, and I have a, I'll have a link on, on the GitHub to this, this is actually from Carl Pearson's paper that was published in 1901, and it's called On the Planes of Closest Fit to Systems of Points in Place. And this data was actually looking at the leg length of men and the length of their trousers. <laughs> <laughs> and I recommend everybody to read this. It's beautifully written, um, but, and all of the, the, the figures are obviously hand-drawn. But essentially, with principal components analysis, you're trying to find centroids through the data, or lines of best fit, and you can minimize um, the least squares here. And you're trying to find multiple vectors through that data such that you're capturing the information in the data. Normally, the first axis captures the largest amount of variance. The second is orthogonal or uncorrelated to it. The axes are ranked such that the first captures the most amount of information, the second captures the, second, the next amount of information. And we can measure the amount of information um, captured by those principal axes by the eigenvalues. Um, so the principal axes, or the components, or the eigenvectors, or the latent factors, or the latent variables, there's many, many names here, are these vectors through the data that represent different trends or sources of variance in the data. They're orthogonal or decorrelated, they're ranked, and because these methods have actually been described multiple times by multiple fields, there's actually a very rich um, number of terms. The eigenvalues describe the amount of information captured by each principal component or eigenvector. And I'm purposely actually using multiple terms simultaneously because we can calculate these methods using least squares or by eigen analysis, or by singular value decomposition, and generate the same data. If we look at the eigenvalues here, we can, oh, sorry. We can decide to keep two, three, four, five number of components, and say that this is actually a reduced representation of the data. The number of components that you retain is somewhat subjective. And definitely within the machine learning community, I often see like 10 picked or two picked, and that's quite arbitrary. If the, these are calculated via singular value decomposition, you will actually decompose a matrix X into three matrices. One is a diagonal matrix here, which is just is all zeros except for the diagonal representing the eigenvalues. The second one here is representing the features, so this will have the same number of rows as the original matrix, and then the number of components that you've chosen to retain. And then you have a matrix here which has got the same, the, the dimensions of it are the number of columns or the number of samples or tumors that we have by the number of components that we decide to retain. A couple of factors to consider when looking at principal components analysis is, first of all, the distance that you're looking at is Euclidean. That may or may not be what's important to you. I know that in genomics, a lot of the times we're interested in groups of genes that are correlated or changing together. Whereas with principal components analysis, you're looking for that scale. You're looking at Euclidean distance. It is robust, but it's designed for multinomial distributed data. If you have data which has a massive scale effect, um, if you look at um, way, um, where maybe one um, feature is maybe measured in like zero to one and something else is measured in zero to a thousand, and you have different scales, what you'll actually begin to see is that the first component will represent maybe 80% of the variance, which doesn't make sense sometimes. And if you see that really skewed distribution of your eigenvalues, consider whether you need to scale the first component. 
The second thing that you tend to see is if you have a lot of zeros in the data, or if you've got nonlinear trends in the data, you may get something called the arch effect, where basically you see this big arch which is represented on the second component. It literally looks like a horseshoe. So if you see either of those two effects, um, quite often if you have a scale effect, you'll also see on the first component that all of the points, all of the weight is actually either on the positive or the negative side of the component. So you literally have the first component here and everything is on one side. That's always a scale effect. Normalize the data and you'll remove that. An alternative approach is to use a method where you're actually dual scaling. So you're scaling on the rows and the columns and correspondence analysis is, is one of these approaches. It's actually an eigenanalysis of a chi-squared matrix. So you actually transform the data such that every single um, point in, in the matrix represents a, a, a chi-squared, um, the expected chi-squared um, measurement. Um, so it's basically the strength of association between our feature and our column. So you actually do it the other way. We tend to transpose the matrix. Um, this has been described multiple times. It's also described as reciprocal um, averaging or ordering or dual, any dual scaling. This tends to be very, very good if you have a scale effect in the data because you're scaling on both the rows and the columns, which you will actually see is you won't ever see that big effect on the first component that you sometimes see in principal components. So if you're seeing something odd on the first component in a principal component analysis, just throw the data into correspondence analysis. If that removes the effect, it's probably an artifact of the PCA. Um, it was originally designed for contingency count data, and it assumes that all of the data is um, positive, but multiple papers have actually described just translating the data, just adding a minimum value to the whole matrix to make it positive, and it seems to be okay. It assumes that the units can be added. It assumes that it's non-negative. It handles gradients better than, than principal components analysis in general, and it handles zeros better as well because you're scaling on the rows and the columns. You also get less of a horseshoe or an arch effect with this. Um, Multi-dimensional scaling is another decomposition approach. I'm not going to do millions of them. I'm just going to do a few, and then I'm going to review it a little bit in a second. Um, but it's actually a decomposition of a distance matrix. So any matrix that you can represent as a distance matrix, so if you look at the Manhattan distance between your points or a Euclidean distance or one minus the Pearson correlation coefficient, and you basically have a distance matrix, you can actually put that into um, multidimensional scaling or also called unprincipled um, coordinate analysis. This is used a lot in ecology. Um, the other thing you can use this is for decomposition of binary data. So if you use, um, if you actually use a, if you if you, if you change your binary data into a distance matrix, you can use principal coordinate analysis on it. Other methods that are widely used is independent component analysis. Um, this is very powerful. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why this is more powerful than a standard principal component analysis. Um, I have a link, I think in two slides time, which actually is a YouTube video which goes into in, in a lot of depth why independent components analysis is actually um, a better approach, particularly if you've got large data sets. Um, intrinsically principal component analysis um, because it's trying to fit a vector globally through the data quite often, and it's looking for those uncorrelated patterns, um, you may miss trends when you've got a larger data set, unless it does make sense to always fit global vectors through the data. Um, independent component analysis it does not constrain the axes to be orthogonal. It's looking for independence, but not orthogonality, so they don't have to be decorrelated. Spectral map analysis is related to correspondence analysis. It's also a method that dual scales the rows and the columns, and there's several methods, several papers that that shows that it also outperforms principal component analysis in a lot of cases. What I'm trying to say here is there's many, many different methods that are all very similar. 
in that these methods apply slight different transformations of the data, but will all give you a reduced dimensional matrix. And sometimes it's worth thinking about how your data is structured. Whether Euclidean distance or correlation is that metric that you want to use, and maybe just read about a little bit about all of these other methods, because in a lot of cases, people just go for principal component analysis and ignore the rest. Right, I have I just want to show you very quickly. Oh. Uh, let me just make the font a little bit bigger. Okay. I will post this on my GitHub. I managed to mess up with my password. Um, but this is code to actually generate principal components analysis using five different packages in R. And I show how they all relate together. So what's the relationship between pre-comp, PR-comp, AD4duty.pca, um, factor minor, what relates to what in each case. Um, and I also... Um, can I actually just render this? I'll just show you. So I also include in this basically taking data and generating eigenvalues and eigenvectors using SVD, using all the packages, so you can understand what's the relationship between them all. The other thing that I have included in this at the very end, which is just what I want to demonstrate, which is one of the, a kind of a very nice package, um, is the package explorer. One second, sorry. Oh, sorry. <sighs> okay. I'm just picking one of these at random, I just want to show. Explorer is a package that will actually take pretty much most of the principal component correspondence, multidimensional scaling, um, multiple correspondence analysis methods that are available in R. And it actually gives you a really nice interface for exploring these, such that you can now actually choose different axes, um, look at the data, look at the interactive plots here. So in this case here, I only took two different axes, but you can actually scroll through all of your axes. You can project additional data onto this um, such that you can visualize what are the, the known annotation that you have in your data. Um, and it provides a very nice way to quickly go through five or six of these methods in about 10 minutes. and it's called Explorer. Okay. Okay. So all of the, me the methods that I've mentioned thus far will actually try to find vectors that capture the global variance in the data. 
that may or may not be appropriate for your data set. So in some cases, we're expecting that there will be features that are maybe only represented in subsets of the data and not all of it. So we want to find local patterns in the data in addition to maybe global patterns, or we only want to find the local patterns and not the global patterns. There's a, several, several methods, I'm not going to go into them, um, called robust PCA, or, um, which focus on basically the background foreground separation. So they'll find a global, global vectors as well as local vectors. But non-matrix, non-negative matrix factorization or NMF is actually a particularly nice method. Um, it will find local um, vectors through the data and they're additive such that you can sum these to actually represent the variance in the data. The disadvantage to NMF is that it's not determined. So it's not just a, state st a standard one matrix representation. You're actually using gradient descent to actually um, optimize the problem and you may not find the same solution each time. I'm just going to briefly mention some of the other methods that we're using quite a lot at the, method, at the moment. One is a method called TISNY. Are people familiar with TISNY? Some are. Um, so this was um, described about 10 years ago now. Um, it's another function where you're actually um, minimizing you have an objective function that you're minimizing using gradient descent optimization. So again, you may not find the optimal solution and you may have to run it several times. However, it's very good at very large data sets. Um, it's faster than NMF. And for visualization of the data, it's nice because when it, it actually plots the data, it tries to avoid data points that are overlapping. So we tend to use that within the single cell data community to try to visualize the patterns of the data. Um, and a lot of people are using this, but I just wanted to point out one or two caveats with this approach. So one is there's many, many parameters within TISNY that do need to be considered, and probably the one that's um, most needing consideration is the perplexity. This trades off between the local and the global. And as you can imagine, that's actually a significant trade-off. So depending on how that is set, which will be unique to your data set, you will see very different results. And that's what's actually um, visualized here at the bottom, is that we're actually, this is the original data set, here we have a complexity of 2, 6, 20, 50, and 100. And as we increase the perplexity, we are seeing very different patterns in our data. So do consider that and maybe run TISNY over a range of parameters. It's not just like PCA where you just throw it in, you do it, and there's only one solution. The second thing with TISNY is that because you're looking at this image, sometimes we're very good at spotting patterns that may or may not exist. And this is all random noise data here. And we're just increasing the, the um, perplexity here. So do consider when you're actually visualizing these, and sometimes you can actually color these up and you think that you found something that is really exciting, how are you going to test it? And this applies for any exploratory data analysis method. It just gives you one synopsis of the data, and it's then how you interpret it. There's been a lot of talk recently, and this is a link to like some of the discussions that, that we've been having about whether within our community at least, TISNY is the approach we should be using or whether we should be using other approaches. And generally, people are using TISNY for visualization, but not for identifying clusters, because we don't think it's actually, we, um, we need to use other methods to think that are more robust. There's a method Dave Riso has recently described, which is actually quite nice. And it actually is a factor analysis approach um, that works really well in high dimensional data where we've got a lot of sparsity or we've got a lot of zeros, which we do have in the single cell data. And this outperforms nearly every version of, of, of principal component analysis that we have. So, 
I know this has been kind of a bit of a, I'm going to stop here for a second and ask if people have any questions on the single data set because I wanted to just go on to sort of like some of the, the, the stuff that we're working at the moment of integrating data, data sets. Um, classical methods like principal component analysis don't stop there if other data, if, depending on your data type. Have a look at whether um, multiple correspondence analysis, which is for quantitative data, approaches for binary data, approaches for categorical data, for count data. There's many, many methods for decomposition. And each of them have their own traits and pros and cons. In a way, I kind of think of looking at principal component analysis to correspondence analysis akin to would I do a hierarchical cluster analysis with a Euclidean distance or with a correlation metric. So do kind of look at these, and the Explorer package that I very quickly demonstrated, I'm happy to show you in more detail, is a nice way to actually run through a lot of those methods quickly. Um, there's many local methods such as um, NMF and TISNY. They're generally s not determined, and they're um, and there's an optimization step in them, but they can be very powerful to detect those local trends. And there are methods which actually will detect global and local trends as well. TISNY is very powerful, but need to watch the parameters. Zimbi Wave, we find better than PCA. It's maybe the last question, robust, but that's very subjective than TISNY. But in reality, it's best to try more than one approach. Does anybody have any questions on this sort of section? Okay. Um, we wrote a review, um, it's now 2016, so it's now two years ago, um, where we actually reviewed decomposition me uh, methods for more than two data sets. So there's actually a very rich field in this. So if you've got two data sets, it's actually very easy. You're essentially doing two principal component analysis and you're projecting them into the same space. And there's several different ways to do that. So you can maximize the correlation between the eigenvectors. So that's essentially canonical correlations analysis. Or you can maximize the covariance between the eigenvectors. And that's essentially something like co-inertia analysis. Um, and, there's ma and there's also many, many different sparse approaches that you can apply as well. I'm not going to focus on these today just to say that these methods, many of these methods exist. Um, when you get on to more than two data sets, it gets more complex. Because at this point in time, you need to decide, is one data set going to be my reference? And am I going to project all of the other data sets onto that space? Or am I going to weight the data sets, either by this, their size or their first eigenvalue, or by maybe some other quality metric that you have in the data? Um, methods that are used quite a lot in um, psychology analysis, such as um, CP analysis, candlecorn parfact, our status may not, and I don't think allow you to actually weight different data sets, but there are many approaches that do allow you to weight them. Um, and statico is one of them. Um, generalized canonical or correlations analysis, multiple corner analysis will all allow you to weight data sets. And when you do this, then you can project as many data sets that you want into the same space. So in this case here, we projected five different data sets into the same space. These were all measures of genes, different, different platforms to measure how genes worked. And we were able then to concatenate all the data in the same space because they've actually all been, all the features have been scaled in that space. And we can also then visualize which platforms or which uh, methodology is actually more effective for our data. So in this case here, we actually have leukemia samples. And we can s visualize the points that are furthest distance from the origin. Those have the greatest weight in that space. And so these points here with higher weight have obviously got higher variance and they're detecting genes, whereas these that are closer to the origin have lower weight. So we can look for consistent patterns and say, well, actually, this approach is working better for this set of um, tumors. Okay. 
One of the other things that's probably the most exciting thing that I'm finding at the moment is we can also take then the literature that we know um, on, on the actual features and we can project that data onto the space. So in this case here, I've taken a set of gene, gene measures, a set of protein measures, but I know things about my features. For example, I know that these genes here are all involved in salicytal. Now in your data, that could be, well, I know these are all the female people, these are all the male, or these are all the people on, I don't know, that bought something from, from the website and these people that didn't. But you can actually project that data supplementary space and then get the mean of all of those points. So that now you're summarizing your groups of features. And that's actually really powerful. In this case here, we actually have genes and we have proteins, but we're mapping them onto biological pathways that we know. And whereas the actual, the individual features, the genes and the proteins don't concur between the data sets, when we, when we map them onto higher level terms, in this case pathways, we're actually finding strong concordance between the data sets. So this could be mapping to zip codes or mapping to some other sort of um, higher level kind of grouping that you can do on the features. And essentially then each point here is just a mean of all of the, the features that map to that annotation or map to that, that term. Okay. This was a pretty cool data set we looked at. This was actually a malaria parasite. And I'm just going to give you a tiny biological vi vignette here. And we actually found the genes and the proteins. And this was actually looking at through the cell cycle. And we actually found that there was a group of genes that are turned on in the um, one stage of the life cycle. But then it's not until the genes are all there, wi waiting, ready to make proteins, but they're being stopped. And they're being stopped by something called a microRNA. And it's only then when they get into the human host the parasite is ready to go and it makes everything go. So it's a fantastic regulation that we actually see the whole way through up, up, up. And we actually even see this when we actually expose cancer cells to drugs, that they'll actually like stop everything so that they can actually kind of hide in, in weight. And it's how we can actually release this is actually really important. So we've actually taken this method whereby we can actually put multiple data sets into the same space. This is available as an R package. You can give it your set of annotations for your features or, or the groups of terms. So for, if you have um, sort of some sort of measured variable on all your patients or all, your, all the people in your study, and now you have some um, group terms for each of those. For example, in our case, it's like gene one, gene two, gene three. Then we create a binary matrix. So in pathway one, one zero, one zero, one zero. In your case, it could be person A, B, C, D, in zip code, whatever, in school system, in work system, whatever. You should create a binary matrix mapping higher level terms onto all your features. You actually just project that onto your space and what you actually get then is a summarization of all of your data on those high level terms. The thing that's terribly powerful about this approach is we can then test those higher level terms for maybe batch effects or artifacts that we know about. And we can just actually remove that component from the data and just redo it without actually any proper CPU usage. We just remove that term, back, back multiply the matrix, and we actually have a method for normalizing out those terms. Um, I'm not going to go into this, but we've actually compared our method to other approaches in the field and we do better. I'm going to give you one quick vignette on how we have applied this. And then I'm going to give you one fun vignette. So one of the projects that I've been involved in recently is we're involved in a project called the, the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. And the Cancer Genome Atlas was a project that was started about eight years ago. And the goal was to sequence 33 different types of tumors and 500 tumors for each patient, each type of tumor. So 500 breast cancer, 500 colon cancer, 500 pr prostate cancer. We found that we actually got many more patients in some studies, so there's a thousand breast cancer patients in the study. There's fewer of some of the rarer cancers, but in total we have about 10,000 tumors in this data set, 
which is a phenomenal resource. And we have not just their DNA, we have their RNA, we have their protein. We have many, many different measures of the cells. And so because we now know that the immune system is one of the key components to fight cancer, we asked, well, can we actually find patterns in the immune cells across these 10,000 tumors? Now, this is a really difficult problem because when this study was designed, we didn't know that the immune system would be so important. And so, in many cases, when this tissue was taken out, when the surgeon took the tumor out, they didn't include the peripheral other cells like the immune cells. And in some cases, they accidentally did. So we had highly variable levels of ratios of tumor cells to non-tumor cells in these tumors. And so various people try to apply different linear model systems to try to measure, well, what are the genes associated with the immune cells such that we could try to detect how many immune cells or which immune cells were associated with prostate cancer or which ones were associated with the colon cancer patients that did better. And so we applied our matrix decomposition approach and what we did was we tried, we decomposed the proteomic state of the genomic state and also a measure of DNA as well. And then we actually clustered that, we applied our gene set method so we got scores over the, all the pathways and we did this over not just all the known pathways but all of our hypothesized pathways and every kind of tagged like these are kinases or these are things in the cell cycle or these are genes involved with olfactory receptors, nose. Any kind of tag we did. We literally threw the kitchen sink at it. And so we got, we did about 10,000 different tags of genes. And so then we scored all of these. And then we filtered for ones that had something to do with the immune system and asked for those that were actually span different cancer types. So more than one anatomical site in the body. And we actually found 16 different clusters. And this told us new things about how the immune system is infiltrating cell types. And so we found some immune clusters were associated with tumors that have a high mutation rate. So the DNA is getting damaged. That typically ha happens in lung cancer where there's DNA, there's damage due to smoking, skin cancer because of the sun. We also found high immune infiltrate in cells that didn't have those. And we're trying to work out why. Maybe is there some viral origin to these? Why is there immune load in these cancers when there isn't strong damage? Or what is it that's damaging that isn't, isn't the DNA? So we're pursuing this, and this is very exciting, but I just wanted to summarize here that there's many, many different approaches for doing matrix decomposition extensions to principal components now, where you can project many data sets into the same space and then constrain the eigenvectors in one way or another. And then you can also project additional data or information that you have on your features onto those and actually summarize the data. And I'm going to finalize with just a little takeaway vignette, which is very, very small. And this is, when you do your exploratory data analysis, be prepared for something you don't expect. And be willing to look for the things that you believe that might be there in addition to the things that you think there's no way. And this is actually a pretty high profile example of that. So there's a very big project called ENCODE to look at all of the elements in the DNA. And so people were looking at the elements in mouse and elements in human and comparing them. And this was published in Nature. And they said that there was the, the species difference was more important than the tissues. Now that's, you know, I read that and I went, really? So the species effect, so a, a liver from a mouse and a liver from a human don't cluster together, but all these diverse tissues within the, 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 the species cluster together. So a mouse brain is closer to a mouse liver than a human liver is closer to a mouse liver. Really? Wow. No, the liver cells should be sharing pathways. They're doing like, you know, detoxification. Aren't they doing stuff that's similar? 
But then another paper came out and they reanalyzed the data and they found the same thing. And this was published in PNAS. And they again said that the mouse and human samples cluster by species. I didn't have time to look at the data, but luckily somebody else did. And when he looked at the supplemental table of how these data were done, there was different technologies used to actually look at different samples. And if you look at this, you might spot a trend. So these here are the different technologies in the, in the columns here. So this is one run and another run and another run and another run and another run. And everything that's in red is human and everything that's in blue is mouse. Can you spot something? Basically, this is completely confounded with the actual runs that they did. So they put all the human ones together and all the mouse ones together. When you take the data and you correct for the run, whoopee-doo, you remove the fact entirely. And now liver clusters with liver and lung clusters with lung. There's some tissues that are different between mouse and human, but generally tissues cluster together, not species. Now, the reason I picked that out is because that was published both in Nature and in PNAS, like two of the biggest journals in the field. And people were willing to believe something that went against everything that we know in biology. So just always be willing to look for the unexpected in your data and assume that there might be a problem. Okay, and with that, I want to thank everybody and um, that I work with and say, may the fourth be with you. <laughs>